Well, praise the Lord, everyone. <laughs> it is 7 o'clock on Wednesday evening, and that means it is time for our midweek Bible study. We are in the midst of a study that I've titled Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. And I hope that you'll take the next 90 minutes or so to join us as we delve into the Word of God. We want to begin our time together this evening as we always begin, and that is seeking the Lord. So if you'll bow your heads with me a moment. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this opportunity once again to come together, albeit by reason of the internet, in order for us to explore the Word of God. Master, how we need the touch from heaven, how we need the anointing of the Holy Ghost at all times. Master, when we open the Word of God, we ought always, with the reading, we ought always to seek the guidance, the direction, the anointing of your Spirit. For this is the only book that comes with the author available to help expound and explain every word that is written. And Master, we ask tonight, God, that you would anoint the teacher, anoint those that listen and watch by reason of the Internet, whether they be live, whether they be watching later by reason of recording. Open our minds, our hearts, our spirit today, that we might receive the engrafted Word of God to the benefit of our soul. Master, anoint every ear, touch every ear of every hearer, and help us to be soft to the leading of the Spirit, for we ask it today in none other than Jesus' wonderful, wonderful name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Praise the Lord. We've been looking at, um, uh, we've been looking lately at areas by which the enemy is able to uh, enter, by which he uh is able to perceive that he has been given permission to access a life. And um, a lot of times, I must explain this, I'm not sure I've explained this very well in the past, but um, a lot of times um, our intent has a great deal to do with whether or not the enemy is able to then use our actions, our conduct, our behaviors as a uh, open door or not. And uh, so um, believers a lot of times uh, can kind of accidentally wander into certain territories where they might not ought to be. And I don't want people thinking that at every turn, you know, the enemy is necessarily immediately able to pounce. However, as we're going to be looking tonight at the last couple of areas where the enemy might uh, perceive that a door has been left open, again, it can be intentional, it can be accidental, but uh, tonight we're going to be looking, uh, to begin with, we're going to look at how the enemy sees spiritual neglect and he perceives the lack of vigilance on the part of an individual uh, surrounding their spiritual well-being. Uh, he perceives that as an opportunity to introduce demonic influence, whether again, whether that be a vexation, whether that be an oppression, ultimately, of course, it can lead to a full-blown possession. It's important to understand when we talk about demon possession, um, 
a lot of times we have a habit when we speak of possession, we have a habit of looking at it in terms of uh, the demon has you because the demon has been given full access to the individual and they've kind of moved in that all of a sudden they own that person. That is not in truth. Uh, that is not factual. In reality, possession is an issue of the individual has come into possession of a demon. Uh, you know, again, we look at it in terms of the demon possesses you, meaning owns you, lock, stock, and barrel. No, no. A demon is always trespassing, always. Um, they, they are not uh, meant to occupy the physical body and the life of an individual. They are capable of doing this. But obviously God uh, did not design us specifically so that a demon could enter in, and we could uh, come into possession of a demon spirit. No, uh, that is not how things are supposed to work. That's not how things are supposed to go. But that is how things can go. But when a demon comes on the scene, and this is important to understand, whether you're a believer or whether you are not a believer, whether you're a Christian or not a Christian, you need to understand that demons entering into the physical realm and becoming intricately, intimately involved in the physical, natural realm, uh, that is a trespass. They are stepping out of bounds, as it were, and uh, they are squatters at all times. At all times, they are squatters. So one of the lies that a demon will often tell when it uh, possesses an individual, uh, the demon will say, you know, I own this person, I own this person. And they know as well as I know that they're lying. They do not own that person. They are trespassing. Uh, they are infringing upon that person's autonomy. They are infringing upon that person's liberty. They are infringing upon that person's life. Now, uh, did somebody leave the gate open? Sure. Did somebody open a door? Sure. Did somebody purposely or inadvertently give them permission to, uh, to be on the scene? Yes. However, that is not God's intent that they should be there. And because God did not design us specifically to host demonic spirits, uh, they are considered trespassers, regardless of whether or not we have inadvertently or purposely opened the door. That's important to understand, because when it comes time to eject them, when it comes time to get rid of them, you need to understand that from a legal perspective, Okay, look at it like uh, an individual who owns a home, and uh, maybe they rent it out to uh, renters. It's an investment property. And then somebody happens to notice this house is empty. The last renter has moved out. Nobody's living there anymore. And they test the doorknob, and they find, aha, somebody left the door unlocked. And they move in, and they stay there for a period of time, and they are a squatter. Now, to eject a squatter after a certain amount of time, you have to go through the same process that you have to go through with an individual who rightfully, legally leased the property. There's a rule in many states and many places that if an individual occupies a 
uh, an address for 30 days or more. If they can prove that they've uh, occupied that address for more than 30 days, they've become a legal occupant, albeit a squatter, but a legal occupant nonetheless. And as a legal occupant, they're not paying rent, and obviously if it's a, uh, a property that you use for investment and you charge rent, and they're not paying rent, well then you're able to evict them on the premise that they're not paying rent. When it comes to demonic spirits, however, uh, the length of time that they're there or how they got there does not change their status from squatter to a legal occupant. And therefore, you do not have to go through some special process to evict a spirit uh, who is there by invitation, for instance, versus one who is there by uh, uh, neglect an individual being careless spiritually, not uh, being mindful of their conduct, doing things that are questionable and dangerous things that open doors, as we've talked about early in our study, uh, experimenting with um, divination tools and things of this nature, uh, Ouija boards, tarot cards, seeking out psychics and mediums and uh, necromancy and all of these sorts of things. Uh, all of those things are openings to the enemy. Every one of those things the enemy is able to respond to by sending forth a spirit to begin to vex you, to oppress you, potentially in the long run, to uh, possess. We use the term possession when it comes to an individual um, leasing a property or renting a property. When they move into the property, we say that they possess the property. Now, do they possess the property? Is the property legally theirs? No. The property legally belongs to the individual who owns the property. But they have the legal right of occupancy. And uh, so this is basically very similar to the way that the demonic uh, realm operates. They... they uh, have been given the, the ability to occupy the property, whether it be by accident or on purpose. Uh, today we're going to look at it again. One of the doors, one of the ways that they gain permission is through uh, spiritual neglect, and they're perceiving a lack of vigilance as an opportunity to introduce demonic <clears throat> influence. In Matthew chapter 12, this is one of the most important portions of Scripture when you're looking at the issue of demons and dealing with demons. This is one of the most important portions of Scripture uh, that you will ever read in your life. Listen carefully. There's, there's a lot packed into this what appears to be a very simple narrative. Matthew 12, 43 through 45. When the unclean spirit is gone out of a man, he walketh through dry places, seeking rest, and findeth none. Then he saith, I will return into my house, from whence I came out, and when he is come, he findeth it empty, swept, and garnished. Then goeth he, and taketh with himself seven other spirits, more wicked. Remember what we said about hierarchy. Remember what we said about lower level spirits are always looking uh, to open the door for higher level spirits. So they're constantly yielding to one that is more wicked than themselves. He said, um, 
Then he goeth and, ta and taketh with himself seven other spirits more wicked than himself, and they enter in and dwell there. And the last state of the man is worse than the first. Even so shall it be also unto this wicked generation. There is a reason why I teach, and, and believe me, I don't know a whole lot of teachers on this subject matter who put as much emphasis as I do on the absolute necessity in waiting on God and doing things according to the Lord's timetable when it comes to dealing with, especially dealing with, demon possession. Uh, there are those out there who try to come across like spiritual supermen, you know, and they act like, well, bless God, you come across a demon, hallelujah, glory to God, you just cast that demon out in Jesus' name and all is well with the world. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The Lord made it abundantly clear that once an unclean spirit is gone out of an individual, he roameth through the dry places, and I believe when the Word of God speaks of dry places, I believe uh, he is basically referring to disembodied. He is disembodied. The human body is primarily made up of water. When he's, when he's able to dwell within a human body, he is not in, quote-unquote, a dry place. However, when he is ejected, when he is uh, cast out, now he has to roam about disembodied, without a host, as it were. And the Word of God tells us that he, at some point, is going to make the decision to return to his former dwelling. Every time you cast out a demon, you can know that that spirit will return. You can know that before you ever start. You can know he's going to come back sniffing around, looking through the windows, testing the doorknob. If a person remains as neglectful and as careless after a demon has been cast out of them, as they were before the demon was cast out, they are going to be open to a much more severe case of possession than they experienced initially. This is why it is so imperative that we wait on the leadership of the Holy Ghost. This is why the Apostle Paul and uh, Silas, why they did not cast the demons out of the fortune teller uh, in the book of Acts when she first began to follow them around, uh, amening every word they said and offering her praise of their message, even though they knew she had a demon, even though they knew that her endorsement of them was not a positive thing. Folks, you don't want the devil endorsing you because that sends a wrong message, okay? And Paul and Silas surely were aware of this, but the Word of God tells us that after some days, Finally, Paul turns to her, and he rebukes the spirit, and he casts the spirit out of her. Why didn't he do it from day one? Well, because if you follow the leadership of the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord knows that she needs some education. 
whilst he was there amening them and offering them, uh, you know, this feigned praise, uh, the reality is at the same time, she was exposing herself to their message. She was hearing what they were saying. And in so doing, by the time they cast the demon out of her, she is in a better position and in a better place in terms of her knowledge of the gospel and her knowledge of the Christian way to be able then to make certain that she is not simply going to leave the house emptied and cleaned up and fixed up and decorated, but still empty. This is the key. When we Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized, tongue talking, Jesus name preachers, cast a demon out of an individual. The very next thing, the minute that spirit leaves, the very next thing we ask God to do is to fill that person with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Because if the house is full of the Holy Ghost, if the house is occupied, if there is the Spirit of God now dwelling there, that Spirit is not going to have the ability to return. And he certainly is not going to be able to bring uh, friends that are going to compound the problem and make it even worse than it was initially. Uh, sometimes people need to hear things. They need to understand things before they're even at a place in their life where they might be able to welcome and receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. And if that is the case, it is better that they hear the teaching, that they hear the preaching, that they hear the admonishments before the Spirit is cast out. So that the minute that Spirit is ejected, they're in a position, they're in a frame of mind, they're in a place of understanding where they might receive the gift of the Holy Ghost immediately. In Romans chapter 8, verses 7 through 11, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. But ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit, if, there's a big word, if so be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Now, if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Now, mind you, the Word of God says, for by one Spirit are ye all baptized into one body. There's only one Spirit. Every gift of the Spirit, all nine gifts of the Spirit, the Word of God, um, dictates that every one of those spirits, uh, excuse me, gifts, operates by the same Spirit, and that is the Spirit of God. Here, Paul says <clears throat> to the church at Rome, you're not in the flesh, but in the Spirit, if so, be that the Spirit of God dwell in you. Then he says, Now if any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he is none of his. Children, I want you to understand something today. The Spirit of God and the Spirit of Christ are one and the same. It's the same Spirit. This is why Paul is using these terms interchangeably. He then goes on to say, And if Christ 
be in you. So he is equating possessing, having the Spirit of God within you with possessing Christ and having Christ in you. He said, and if Christ be in you, the body is dead because of sin, but the Spirit is life because of righteousness. So the body is still subject to sin, but your spirit is now in a whole brand new realm of existence. Your spiritual man is in a whole brand new place. It is clothed, it is covered, it is surrounded by the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when God looks at a believer, all he sees is the righteousness of Christ. He goes on to say in verse 11, But if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus the man from the dead, if the Spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, if that Spirit dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal bodies by his spirit that dwelleth in you. Folks, there is a reason the infilling of the Holy Ghost is part and parcel to the plan of salvation articulated by the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost. Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall, not you may, not you might, not you can, not you could, not you should, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you, to your children, to them that are afar off, and listen, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So now he's going beyond geography, he's going beyond generations, and now he's going through the annals of time to come, and he says, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So every believer, every person who is ever called to faith in God, every believer who is ever called to repent and turn from unbelief to faith in God through the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is commanded first to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ uh, for the remission of sins. Paul said, excuse me, Peter said it as plainly as you can say it, repent and be baptized. Who? Every one of you. How? In the name of Jesus Christ. Why? For the remission of sins. Come on, folks, it's not hard. Peter made it abundantly clear. Who? How? Why? Everybody, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And then he says, and you shall receive. Hallelujah. If you're a believer today and you have not yet received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, do not be dismayed because the promise of God's word is, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. It's as easy as receiving it. It's as easy as accepting it. Uh, a lot of people who have been subject to false teaching and false doctrine for a good part of their life, uh, they wind up building up a lot of uh, psychological uh, obstacles that kind of 
get in the way of their receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. If you spent half your life in the Southern Baptist Church being told that speaking with other tongues is of the devil and it's demonic, then people become fearful and they become afraid. Oh Lord, you know, what if I if if I were, if if I experience this and it's really a devil? But Jesus said, you don't ask your father for bread and have him give you a stone. You don't ask your father for a fish and he gives you a scorpion or a serpent. Said, no, uh, the same is true of asking God for the gift of the Holy Ghost. It requires faith, folks, faith is the key to salvation. And you've got to first believe the promise of God. You shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. you got to believe the promise. Secondly, you've got to believe what God has said. If you ask him for the Holy Ghost, you're going to get the Holy Ghost said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? So if you have a mental block, if you have some kind of a hindrance to your receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, just claim the promise of God's word, Lord, you said if I ask for the Holy Ghost, you're not going to give me a, a, you're not going to allow something different to come my way. The enemy can't pull that stunt. But he will indeed and in fact give you the gift of the Holy Ghost. But if it takes a little while, I tell people, don't be fearful, but still look for it, wait for it, be in anticipation. Uh, desire it. Ask God for it. You know, you don't have to spend 24 hours a day praying, you know, God, give me the Holy Ghost. God, give me the Holy Ghost. But, you know, when there's a, a move of God in the church service, go down to the altar, spend some time in prayer at the altar, say, Lord, I'm waiting on the gift of the Holy Ghost, and now be a good time. I'm in your presence. Your spirit is moving in this place. I can feel you, Lord, moving by your power. Go ahead, God, today. Let today be the day that I receive the baptism with the Holy Ghost. And the initial physical evidence, how do we know we've received the baptism of the Holy Ghost? It's a spiritual transaction, but it is a spiritual transaction that comes with a physical confirmation. How do we know? Because when God breathes the gift of the Holy Ghost into our life, he is, in effect, giving our spiritual man, which is dead in trespass and in sin, he is giving our spiritual man mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation. He's blowing air in, just like the Word of God said he did with Adam in the, the first book, Genesis. said, and God breathed into Adam's nostrils, and Adam became a living soul. And God breathes life into our spiritual man. And when our spiritual man, which is just a part of you, it's not something else, it's not something extra, it's not something different, it is a part of you. When your spiritual man suddenly breathes in, that wonderful gift of life in Christ by reason of the Holy Ghost, that spiritual man within you is going to start to praise God and thank God. You're going to begin to thank God and praise God, but it won't be coming from your intellect. It will not be coming from your mind. It will be coming out from your very spirit. And the Word of God says when we pray in the Spirit, when we pray uh, in another language as God gives us the utterance, it is our spirit that prayeth. So your spiritual man will begin to 
pray and worship God and thank God. And it will simply be in a language you do not otherwise understand. And when those surround you, if anybody surrounds you, hear this, they know you got the Holy Ghost. If you recognize this has happened, then you know you've got the Holy Ghost. God literally designed it to work this way. I've got to tell you real quick, I've known preachers who have traveled to other countries, African countries, uh, countries on other continents, and they said that uh, uh, after they had preached and people began to come down to the altars and many people were seeking and asking God for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and uh, the preacher was sitting there on the pulpit or walking around praying for folks. And one of the host uh, pastors would say to him, Do you hear that lady over there worshiping the Lord? And uh, the preacher said, Yes, yes. You know, he sees this little young lady over here just worshiping God. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, you're wonderful. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise your name, Lord. And the host preacher says, she doesn't know English. <laughs> she received the Holy Ghost. She's speaking in English. She doesn't know English. So you see a person in other countries who would speak in an unknown tongue, it's unknown to them. That's how we know that our intellect and our flesh is not at all engaged in the process. Our physical man has nothing to do with this spiritual transaction. The fact that it is a language we do not know is proof that it is indeed a divine transaction. Um, you know, I've told this story before, but I have to tell it again real quick. My great aunt, is now in her 90s. I got to visit with her about, I think it was about two years ago or so. I had heard her testimony over the years, uh, but I got to hear it from her firsthand. And uh, she's of German descent. My uncle met her overseas during World War II. They married. It took him quite a lot to get her back to the States. Uh, he finally was able to bring her back to the United States. And uh, she began to attend, at one point, a Baptist church. My grandmother and my great-grandmother, who were born uh, Portuguese Catholic, uh, they had already been born again. They had come into the uh, Pentecostal faith, they'd been baptized in the name of the Lord, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and uh, they would ask my aunt on occasion if she'd like to come uh, go to church with them, and my aunt would go to church with them. And my aunt said, oh, the way those people worship back then, my family, my grandmother and her children and all were going to a little independent one God Jesus named Church in Walcott, Connecticut, pastored by an incredible man of God, Brother Warren Tatlock, who, by the way, dedicated me when I was a baby and married my parents. Um, and Brother Tatlock was an incredible man of faith, a powerful man in the power of the Holy Ghost. And uh, they would go to Brother Tatlock's, they went to Brother Tatlock's church, and my Aunt Betty said, oh my Chuck, oh how those people worship. She said, oh, oh, they, they, the, the Spirit of the Lord would come down and they would be dancing and shouting and running the aisles. She said, oh, it was so energetic, but it was so wonderful. It was so beautiful. She said, here I was, a little Baptist girl visiting this church, and I didn't understand everything that was going on. She said, all I knew is that these people loved God so much. They loved the Lord so much, she said. And boy, 
their worship was so passionate and it was so wonderful. And, and she said, and I often would leave and I would say, Lord, you know, uh, I, I don't know because my church says that this is wrong and this is of the devil and blah, 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 and all this foolishness, you know. And she'd go back to her Baptist pastor because the Baptist uh, faith is nothing but an enormous cult based on uh, pastoral dictatorship. If you ever talk to fundamentalists, and evangelicals, especially Southern Baptists, they constantly, constantly will say, well, my pastor says this, my pastor says that. They don't say the Word of God says thus and so. The Word of God says thus and so. No, it's my pastor, my pastor. And they're taught that this is how things are supposed to work. You're supposed to uh, take the word of your pastor in understanding the word of God. You can't just read it and expect that you'll understand it yourself. No, 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 no. Your pastor makes it clear. Your pastor articulates it for you. And if you have any questions or any Thoughts, you need to run them by your pastor. This is how the Southern Baptist uh, uh, system works, folks. And so finally, one day my aunt said that uh, she went to church with my grandmother and she said, and I was sitting there and I finally was just so hungry. She said, I was so hungry for God and I was so hungry she said, in, in this wonderful experience these people were having, she said, oh my goodness, it, was, it looked so wonderful. She said, I asked the Lord quietly to myself. She said, and I spoke to the Lord and I said, Lord, if this baptism of the Holy Ghost is real, if this speaking in tongues is real, if this is really you, she said, let me hear someone speak in my native tongue, in German. And my Aunt Betty said that she no sooner said those words. She said, I literally just finished praying those words. And all of a sudden, this little lady in the church stood up and started speaking in perfect, fluent German. And my Aunt Betty began to speak the words of praise that this lady, because she remembers the exact words this lady was saying. And she says, but what was so amazing was this little lady who was speaking perfect German was Italian. And she could not speak English very well because she had such a thick Italian accent. She said, and yet she was speaking German fluently. She said, without any accent, without any obstruction, she just began to praise and magnify God in fluent German. And my Aunt Betty said, I knew then that this was the way, and she said, she threw her hands up in the air, and God filled her with the Holy Ghost. So I want to tell you folks, this thing is real. I mean to tell you, it's real. And when God fills you with the Holy Ghost, it makes God real to you at a level you cannot even fathom. That's one of the things that scares the enemy about people receiving the Holy Ghost because it makes God so real to you, it'll blow your mind. And that's what he's trying to do. That's what the Lord wants to do. He wants to make himself real to you. He wants to be able to manifest himself in you and through you so that you can experience, if I might say it this way, his realness, his authenticity. So there is a reason that God includes the baptism of the Holy Ghost in the plan of salvation. 
an empty or an abandoned structure is a de facto invitation to squatters. This is an example of negligence being the cause for occupation or possession. The unclean spirit may not have been welcomed or invited verbally, but the empty, thus unguarded and unprotected dwelling screams out to be occupied. You know, in the real world, empty and abandoned buildings often become dwellings for squatters. Uh, as well as the homeless and runaways and things of that sort. We often see on television shows related to the paranormal how that people will often use empty and abandoned structures to conduct satanic or occult rituals. The most important thing one who has been possessed by a demon must do is immediately upon being delivered from that occupation they are to invite in to their life the spirit of Almighty God remember God also responds only to invitation you have to open the door you have to open the door that's why we sing songs like, Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. You'd be surprised how many people have received the baptism of the Holy Ghost as they sang that song. Because in singing that song, you're throwing open the door. You're welcoming the presence of God. You're welcoming the power of God. Some people, one of the greatest hindrances to receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost, they're afraid of what's going to change after they receive the Holy Ghost. There's kind of that fear of the unknown. You know, oh, is, is all of a sudden my view on everything going to change? Is all of a sudden this going to change or that going to change? No, let me tell you what's going to change. You're going to love the Lord more than you ever loved the Lord. You're, gonna, you're going to have a much greater sense of, of how real God is, your faith is going to explode, your love is going to explode. All the attributes of God are brought into your life by the presence of His Spirit. God is love, peace, all the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness, um, all of these things are, are going, you're going to just feel them flooding your soul because they are the manifestation or the fruit of the Spirit in your life. So that's what you're going to experience. Don't worry about um, the details. Nothing bad's going to come that much, I can promise you. All right? So, uh, So immediately upon being delivered from demons, we want to invite the Spirit of God in so that the sanctified vessel, the vessel that has now been purged and cleaned, can be occupied by the Holy Ghost and not left, vanc not left vacant, albeit sanctified, cleaned up by the power of God, through the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. In 1 Peter 5, 8, and 9, once again, be sober, be vigilant. We're talking about the lack of vigilance, being careless, not 
taking care of business, not doing what you need to do in order to make certain uh, that you uh, remain free of demonic influences before and or after uh, experiencing oppression or possession. But he said, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. What does verse 9 mean? It's, it's very simple. Honey, you ain't in this thing alone. You're not the only one the enemy attacks. You're not the only one the enemy tries to victimize. You're not the only one the enemy uh, tries to rob of their faith and rob of their joy. The Word of God said, The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. If he can take from you those gifts that God has given you, peace and love and joy and patience. If the enemy can rob you of those things, he'll do it. He'll certainly do it. Then down in Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 again, I told you we're, we do some overlap. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. So, the Word of God admonishes us to put on the armor. That requires that we not be negligent. We've got to put on the armor. It's not enough to know what the armor is. That's why I say people who think they can serve God and they don't have to go to church and they don't have to be part of the body of Christ, they're foolish. They're foolish. That is not, that is not the way God himself designed this faith to work, folks. That's not how this thing works. You cannot be an independent cell from the body separate from the rest of the body. You can't do it. If you're going to be healthy, if you're going to survive, you have to be connected. You have to be part of the whole body of Christ. You've got to be part of the body. Body ministry is so important. When we're weak, when we're struggling, there's someone there who is able to help lift us up and bolt and buttress us and help us to overcome and endure. We compensate for one another. The Word of God said, Bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. When you're in a good old-fashioned, Holy Ghost-filled, fire-baptized Spirit-filled church. I'm going to tell you something. Oh, honey, there ain't nothing in the universe like it. There is nothing in the world like it. You can come in so battered and beat up, and you don't have to say a word to anybody. You're part of the body, and the Spirit of God is the nervous system for the body. So if you prick your finger on a pin over here, your finger doesn't have to send a message to your elbow to lift your hand up. No, 
automatically your nervous system responds. The same thing is true when you're going through struggles and troubles and hardships. If you're in a good Holy Ghost filled church, honey, there's going to be somebody in that church who hears from the Lord and says, I need to get hold of that brother. I need to get hold of that sister. We need to go down to the altar and pray for a while. I need to help them pray this through. I need to help them uh, get victory in this situation and overcome this obstacle and this struggle that they're going through. Body ministry is so important, and body ministry is not something you can do isolated and alone. You have to be physically, physically connected to the body. This is why the Lord Jesus Christ said, By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I can love God's people as imperfect as they may be. I don't expect just because somebody's a Christian that they do everything right, they say everything right, that they never make mistakes, that they never misspeak. No, why would I expect that of them if they're looking at me with that same criteria? Got news for you, I'm going to disappoint them many times over. So I hope they're not looking at me thinking that either. But I can love God's people because we all have that shared common experience. We all are in possession of the Holy Ghost. We all have been baptized into one body. We're all part of that sacred fraternity of Jesus' name, baptized believers. Who I'm preaching today a little bit. Negligence is also manifested in our, in our allowing ourselves to become impaired or to lose control of our bodies or our minds. This is why believers are instructed to abstain from drunkenness or impairment brought about by drug use or substance abuse. When in uh, an impaired state, we become vulnerable to spiritual influences. When the Word of God talks about wizardry, when it talks about wizards, it literally is speaking of people, even in ancient times, who used substances, we call them herbs, <laughs> and they would use what amounted to drugs. They would use different substances in order to uh, bring themselves into a, uh, an alternate state of mind and an alternate state. And it was in that state that they would become... Um, subject to demonic influence and uh, oftentimes to demonic possession. So w these are things we want to avoid and we want to keep ourselves from. When we're in an alternate st uh, state of mind because of drugs or substances, we are not of a sound mind so that we might act to protect ourselves from uninvited or unwelcome influences. Again, wizards, as they are described in the Bible, were, were often those who used mind-altering substances to quote-unquote get in touch with the spirit realm. The law of Moses called for the expelling or extermination of anyone who engaged in such practices as the infection of such individuals within Jewish society would open the door to any number of potential spiritual issues. Now, Satan and demonic spirits will take advantage here our last point, I believe, 
uh, as to as to doors that uh, the enemy perceives as doors or openings or invitations for him. They will often take advantage, listen carefully, this is an important one, of human emotion. This is why it's important that we learn not, not that you can't have feelings, folks. No, nobody's telling you to run around like, you know, a Stepford wife or run around like a zombie or, you know, an emotionless robot. No, no, no. But just know how to respond and react to your emotions in such a way so as not to inadvertently open a door to the enemy. Ephesians 4.26, for instance, says to us, Be angry and sin not. So the Lord doesn't say you can't be angry. No, he said be angry, but don't let that anger drive you to do something sinful. Don't let that anger drive you to seek vengeance or retribution. Don't let that anger drive you to harm another person. Don't let that anger drive you um, to murder, you know, uh, or, or any number of horrific acts. Be angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. So again, what he is saying is, when you are angry, find a way to address it, Find a way to satisfy it and quell it before the day is out. Don't let it fester. Don't let it stay day after day after day. Don't let it keep going and keep going. Because when we do that, the enemy sees a door that has been left open. It says, aha, this person is nursing their anger. This person is nursing their bitterness. This person is nursing their hatred. This person is nursing their uh, jealousy, even jealousy. Proverbs 21 verse 23, whoso keepeth his mouth and his tongue keepeth his soul from troubles. Proverbs 22 24 and 25, make no friendship with an angry man, and with a furious man thou shalt not go, lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. I'm sorry, but I have to use this example because it is the most obvious example in our world today. We see millions of Christians fawning over Donald J. Trump and just following this guy blindly and virtually worshiping him, and yet he is an angry man. That man is so full of anger that everything he talks about, every word that comes out of his mouth is grievance and angst and anger. He's talking about retribution. He's talking about vengeance. And what do we see happening in the church? Do we see the church influencing him in a positive way? Or do we see him in his anger influencing the church in a negative way? I think most people can recognize that he's inspiring all kinds of negativity within people who call themselves evangelical Christians. They're buying into his ways. And yet the Word of God tells us plainly, make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man Thou shalt not go. Said, don't hit your wagon to a furious man. Why? Lest thou learn his ways and get a snare to thy soul. Proverbs 15, 13. A merry heart maketh a cheerful countenance, but by sorrow of the heart the spirit is broken. So we see the enemy can use 
uh, our emotions. And this is one reason why when we are in a sorrowful state, when we're in mourning, when we're in grieving, some people will almost avoid um, any possibility of laughter or levity. Uh, I was watching a program recently uh, that Tommy and I started watching on uh, uh, Max, and uh, it's kind of an interesting little program, but anyway, and there was a funeral going on, and the man conducting the funeral opened the floor up to people and invited them if they had anything to say about the deceased, you know, come on up and, and speak about the deceased. And nobody was getting up. Nobody was had anything to say. And finally, uh, this the, the deceased's daughter was working for a comedian lady. And the comedian lady had kind of snuck in to the funeral and was kind of almost hiding in the back, you know, trying to not be too intrusive or anything. So finally she gets up and says, well, let, let me start this out. And she begins to talk and she said, you know, you can't just throw this at people. You can't just say to people, well, if you got anything to say, say it, you know, blah, blah, blah. And uh, she said, because, you know, a lot of people, they, they, they kind of need a warm up, you know, they kind of, and she started making light. She started making uh, levity. And she she started making comments like, well, you know, there has to have been some time when uh, this man who I didn't know, you know, got so drunk that he did something funny or he did something embarrassing. So she, in other words, she kind of threw something out there specific that somebody might be able to draw upon. And then she asked one fellow, said, yeah, how about you? You know, uh, did he ever do anything funny? Like, And then the man started talking, said, yeah, there was one time with us and so. And before you know it, she had the whole room laughing and everybody was laughing. And that is a good thing. There's nothing wrong in our sorrow. There's nothing wrong in our grief with allowing ourselves to laugh. There's nothing wrong with allowing ourselves to see levity and to be lighthearted at times. Because if we allow ourselves only to soak in the negative emotion, if we allow ourselves only to bathe in the grief and in the sorrow, we're going to wind up in a very broken, very vulnerable place emotionally. And this is what we want to be careful of. We want to be mindful of. The enemy will use folks. The enemy even uses grief. He even uses sorrow. He even uses heartache. You can have a broken heart over a failed marriage. You can have a broken heart over... Um, a relationship that's gone bad. And if you just allow yourself to bask in the negativity of the feeling of the moment, you're putting yourself in a dangerous place. You're putting yourself in a very bad position. So always be mindful that... Um, there's nothing wrong when you're feeling bad. There's nothing wrong when you're feeling sad. Uh, now, there, there's nothing wrong with feeling that way to begin with, okay? I'm not saying there's anything wrong with feeling sorrow or feeling grief. But there's also nothing wrong while you're in that state in allowing yourself to seek uh, some levity, to seek merriment, okay? To... Uh, experience something lighthearted and something that might just inspire a little laughter and inspire a little lightheartedness. That'll help to keep you balanced. That'll help to keep you, spiritually speaking, in a good and less vulnerable place. Proverbs 
1722, we've heard this. A merry heart doeth good like a medicine, but a broken spirit drieth the bones. Proverbs 25, 28, He that hath no rule over his own spirit is like a city, listen, that is broken down and without walls. So especially believers, we ought to have rule over our own spirit. We've got to be mindful. We know we're spiritual beings. We know that we are in possession of the Spirit of God. So we know that God offers the joy of the Lord as our strength. We know that God offers us peace. We know He offers us joy. We know He provides us with comfort. And therefore, when we are in need of these things, we ought to seek these things out. To be negligent and not to seek out, you know, Lord, I need you to restore my joy. I've had to pray that prayer a lot of times in the last many years. Many, many times I've had to say, Lord, restore my joy. I wrote a little song years. I've written a number of songs, but I don't know how to write music, so I've never been able to write the lead sheet for them. But I wrote a little song years ago that said, Lord, restore my joy, restore my peace, restore my soul, O Lamb of God, restore my joy, restore my peace, restore my soul. For I'm tired and so weary, and I've yet many miles to go. And that is why each day I cry, Lord, restore my soul. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 4.13 But I would not have you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. The key here is we have hope. We have the promise of God. So it's not, Paul is not telling the church that they cannot grieve. He's not telling the church they can't be sad. He's not telling the church they cannot weep at the loss of a loved one or a friend or someone uh, they admire, whatever the case might be. But he is saying, but even in our grief, we ought to be mindful and, and remember, we have hope, we have faith, we believe we're going to see them again. You know, I, I talk about my great-grandmother all the time, and I think she was one of the greatest Holy Ghost-filled Christian ladies that ever walked on planet Earth. If anybody knew how to live the Christian life and really made an honest, concerted effort to do so, it was my great-grandmother. When my great-grandmother died, I never experienced grief like it in my life. I'll be honest with you. I never experienced that level of grief in my entire life. I was so devastated. I was so crushed. I was so hurt. Her presence in my world just brought something so positive. I, I just can't even explain it. Just knowing that that lady was here in this life did something positive for me and for God only knows how many other people because everybody that ever met her fell in love with her and adored her. And um, even my Aunt Dorothy's church in Texas, uh, they had known my grandmother for many years because she used to go down to Texas during the winter months. And my aunt would come up to the Northeast during the summer months, and then my grandmother would go down to Texas during the winter months, so it wouldn't so you know wouldn't be as cold and what have you. 
And so the church down there knew my grandmother. And when my great-grandmother died uh, at her funeral up in Connecticut, there were flowers all over the place that were from Texas, from people in Texas. Because everybody that met her, I kid you not, everybody that met her just adored her. Absolutely adored her. When I stood beside the grave, uh, I had served as a, pall a pallbearer. As I stood beside the grave and the service came to a close and everybody began to go off to their cars. I, uh, I walked over to the casket and I had never done anything like this in my life before. But I just kind of put my hand on the box and I, I said, Grandma, this is as close as I'll ever be to you this side of heaven until the Lord comes. And grief literally crushed me. And I fell down on my knees and I started to wail. I didn't cry. I wailed. I mean, you could hear me probably halfway across town. My heart was so broken. But in all that pain, in all that grief, in all that sorrow, I never, ever lost sight of the hope, hallelujah, that we have in Christ. I never lost sight of the promise of God's word. Brethren, I would not have you ignorant concerning them which are asleep. Oh, for we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, whoo, glory, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, glory to God. The dead will rise first, and we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together. Oh, I want to tell you, I believed then on that day, even as brokenhearted as I was, I believed that one morning in God's eternal timetable, one morning, my grandma's going to come flying up out of that grave and I'm going to be right behind her and I believe we're going to have that great jubilee in the sky that great reunion in the sky and that is a hope that I never I could never never lose because my faith is real to me but you know folks a lot of people even Christians, when they lose a loved one, they are careless with their emotions. They do not guard their spirit. They're neglectful. And they allow their grief to run away with them. And they lose sight of the hope. They lose sight of the promise of God. They do not respond to the, the situation at hand with faith and confidence in the Word of God. And you've heard me say throughout this study, it is imperative that we respond to every situation from a biblical Christian perspective. That's, that's an absolute necessity. They lose sight, and the next thing you know, they, in their grief, they have opened a door, and then next thing you know, they're angry with God, they're upset with the Lord, and the, 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 the devil loves when people get angry with God. He can motivate people who are angry at God to do all kinds of things and to open all kinds of doors. And I've talked about it before. I know people who lost a loved one and, and, 
And instead of approaching things from a biblical Christian perspective, instead of keeping that hope that we have at the forefront of their thinking, instead of responding from a position of faith, they allowed themselves to grow bitter. They allowed themselves to grow angry. And before too long, uh, a spirit of violence came in. And before too long, uh, they wound up committing murder. And it was something that was so contrary to their personality. It was something so contrary to who they were for so much of their life, but you literally could trace it back to the death of that loved one and their specific response to that death. In Proverbs 15, 27, the word of the Lord says, He that is greedy of gain troubleth his own house, but he that hateth gifts shall live. So this is warning us that greed can be a very dangerous thing. Greed can be very dangerous, folks, and it is better to be one who doesn't care about receiving gifts and being given things than it is to be somebody who constantly is wanting and constantly looking for something, constantly expecting something. So again, if we're going to be in charge of our own spirit, then we have to guard ourselves against uh, the human emotion, the area of greed. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 17 through 19. This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord that ye henceforth walk not as other Gentiles walk in the vanity of their mind, having, their understand, having the understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart, who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness to work all uncleanness with greediness. Ephesians talking about human emotions being a potential door, if not handled properly, being a door that it, uh, can be left open, inviting spiritual influence. Ephesians 4.31, Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. Colossians 3 and 8, But now ye also... Put off all these, anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy communication out of your mouth. John 13 and 2, uh, talking about the issue of greed and supper being ended. Listen, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him. So we see that Judas betrayed the Lord because he was at the very least oppressed by the devil. And the area that the enemy was able to access Judas' life was through his greed. Judas had a reputation <clears throat> as one who was somewhat greedy and selfish. <coughs> And the enemy took advantage of that. So we must guard ourselves against that. Proverbs 25, 21, and 22. If thine enemy be hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he be thirsty, give him water to drink. For thou shalt heap coals of fire upon his head and the Lord shall reward thee. That's talking to issues like resentment, 
anger, bitterness, revenge. How do we deal with anger, resentment, bitterness, revenge? Well, the Word of God gives us a specific answer. And if we're going to react in a biblical Christian manner, then this is how we ought to act. If our enemy's hungry, give him something to eat. If he's thirsty, give him water to drink. Romans 12, 14 through 21. Bless them which persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with them that do rejoice, and weep with them that weep. Be of the same mind one toward another. Mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate. Be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. And I just read to you a moment ago, uh, verses 21 and 22. First John 2 and 9. I'm going to try to go through these last several scriptures real fast. And hopefully uh, I won't go too much over time. First John 2 and 9. He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. 1 John 2.11 But he that hateth his brother is in darkness and walketh in darkness and knoweth not whither he goeth because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. So there's no room for hate. We, we, there is no place for hatred in the life of God's people. And yet I know Christians who hate gay people. I know Christians who hate black people. I know Christians who hate this or that kind of person. No, there's no room for hatred in the life of a believer. First uh, John three fifteen. Whosoever hateth his brother is a murderer, and ye know that no murderer hath eternal life abiding in him. 1 Peter 3, 8 and 9, Finally, be all of one mind, having compassion one of another, love as brethren, be pitiful, be courteous, not rendering evil for evil or railing for railing, but contrawise blessing, knowing that ye are therefore called thereunto, called that ye should inherit a blessing. Romans 12, 19, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay saith the Lord. So vengeance is something that we cannot give any room to, okay? We can't contemplate it, can't think about it, we can't nurse it. Hebrews 10, 30 and 31, for we know him that hath said, vengeance belongeth unto me. I will recompense, saith the Lord, and again, the Lord shall judge his people. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a, the living God. Jeremiah 51, 36, Therefore, thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will plead thy cause and take vengeance for thee, and I will dry up her sea and make her springs dry. Now we've got, again, Donald Trump's out there promising uh, the religious right, promising the Republican base that he is their vengeance. He is their recompense. Folks, that is demonic. That is evil to the core. And yet there are millions of Christians who are adoring the fact that he is making this claim. 
Matthew 5, 43 through 47. Ye have heard that it hath been said, Thou shalt love thy neighbor and hate thine enemy. But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, do good to them that hate you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven, for he maketh his Son to rise on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and on the unjust. Excuse me. For if ye love them which love you, what reward have ye? Do not even the publicans the same. And if ye salute your brethren only, what do ye more than others? Do not even the publicans so. Job 5 and 2. For wrath killeth the foolish man, and envy slayeth the silly one. Proverbs 14.30, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy the rottenness of the bones. Proverbs 27 and verse 4, wrath is cruel and anger is outrageous, but who is able to stand before Envy. We, we don't even think oftentimes about how dangerous and how powerful an emotion envy can be. But envy, my friend, has motivated a lot of people to do a lot of crazy things in this life. And we, as children of God, have to guard ourselves against envy, becoming envious, allowing ourselves to be envious of others. Whether it be a family member, a friend, a co-worker, uh, a neighbor, somebody in the church. Romans 13, 13. Just a few more quick scriptures. Let us walk honestly as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. 1 Corinthians 3 and 3, For ye are yet carnal, for whereas, for whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are ye not carnal and walk as men? Paul's writing to the church at Corinth. He said, y'all, there's envy going on between you. You got people arguing and, and combating one another. There are divisions among you. He said, you're, you're acting carnal. That's not how spiritual people conduct themselves. Folks, we need to be in more active control of our emotions. What we allow ourselves to feel and how we respond to what we feel is on us, okay? Um, three more. James 3.14, but if ye have bitter envying and strife in your hearts, glory not and lie not against the truth. James 3.16, for where envying and strife is, there is confusion and every evil work. So if we allow ourselves to be taken over by a spirit of envy, if we allow ourselves to be motivated uh, by a, a spirit of strife, if we allow ourselves to constantly be in a position where we're at odds with somebody and, we, and we, we give ourselves permission to do this, folks, we're putting ourselves in a very dangerous place. James said, that where these things are envying and strife, there is confusion and every evil work. Lastly, today, so that next week we can move on with our study into new ground, Proverbs 22 and verse 10. Cast out the scorner and contention shall go out. Yea, strife and reproach shall cease. So, scorners, somebody who 
is constantly angry, upset, at odds, somebody full of angst and negativity. Folks, no. I know Christians who live like this, and I guarantee you, as sure as I'm alive, I know for a fact that they are oppressed of the enemy and they don't even know it. They've got demons knocking on their door every day, all day, pushing them, motivating them. If you give yourself to be constantly angry, constantly filled with negativity and angst and hatred and envy and all of these negative emotions, the enemy is going to feed that fire. He's going to keep throwing sticks onto the fire until you have finally allowed the door to open enough so that a spirit can kind of edge its way in there. And then it's going to be pushing that door further and further open until more and more powerful spirits are able to exercise influence in your life. And this is not how a believer wants to conduct themselves. We want to be in control of our spiritual man Part of being in control of our spiritual man is not being neglectful concerning spiritual things. And part of not being neglectful is being mindful of our emotions. Nothing wrong with feeling any number of things. But there are those emotions which are negative and wicked and evil, which we ought not to give any fuel to. And then there are those emotions which we are given by God permission to experience, for instance, anger and grief and sorrow. But we ought always respond to these emotions from a biblical Christian perspective. So in anger, we don't seek out vengeance or retribution. We don't seek out murder. We don't seek out... Um, uh, you know, some way to harm the person who has harmed us. No, we're to respond to evil with good, not to respond to evil with evil. Anyway, folks, uh, this concludes this portion of our study. Next week, I think we're going to be moving into some areas that you'll find uh, uh, prob probably uh, even a little bit more interesting if you're not a believer, especially what we've talked about in the last several weeks has been very spiritual and very much um, more applicable to the life of a Christian, certainly. Uh, but we're going to start looking now at the ghost ghouls and goblins, okay, and the things that go bump in the night. Now that we understand the basics of the spirit realm, now that we understand how spirits work, we understand that there are rules that they have to play by and rules that they operate by, and we understand uh, that there are any number of areas that um, they're able to use to... Um, as an invitation or an open door. Now that we've seen all that, as we begin to look into the supernatural and uh, the paranormal, you're going to much, much, much more easily be able to understand, aha, now I understand how this whole thing got started. Now I get how this whole thing came about. Now you know what to look for. You know what to listen for. If you were the one having to work with somebody who was in a situation dealing with paranormal or um, supernatural occurrences of one nature or another, you would know the questions to ask. You'd know what direction to go in. Uh, you always have to look for um, where did the door open. And if you, if you can um, determine where the door was open, uh, then a lot of times you're able to help that person deal with that issue in the right way. And you're able to help them achieve deliverance and victory and at the same time, close that door and keep it closed, okay? Let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close this session tonight. 
And by the way, keep me in prayer. I'm, I'm very, very upset. Today, my doctor uh, poo-pooed my surgery for tomorrow. I was supposed to have this sinus surgery tomorrow, and I was so looking forward to it because I've been suffering for so many years with this trouble. And my general practitioner turned around and decided, no, you need to wait a few months because you had been diagnosed with a blood clot in your lung, which, mind you, they said cleared up weeks and weeks and weeks ago. So I don't know why that would be an issue now. But anyway, uh, so he went and uh, refused to authorize the surgery, to give the surgeon permission. So... Um, I'm not able to have that tomorrow as I had planned, which means I have at least another three months to suffer. And I'm not happy about it at all, not even remotely happy about it. So please keep me in prayer. That's an area where you talk about not wanting to give the enemy any space, because I could be really mad about this right about now. And I could stay mad about it for a very long time if I gave myself permission to, because seriously, this, this has been something that I've been looking for belief for so long and I finally saw a light at the end of the tunnel and I was so ecstatic that I was finally going to be able to breathe through my nose for a change and quit looking like a bunny rabbit you know constantly because I have such a hard time my doctor said my sinuses are practically completely closed she said you you have very little passageway there. So anyway, keep me in prayer. Master, we love you, God, today. We thank you, Lord, for this time in the Word of God. We thank you for this subject matter and an understanding of these important things. As we move forward in this study, O oh God, we ask that you would help us to take that which we have already learned the knowledge which we have already gleaned, and apply it, Lord, to those situations which we'll be addressing in the weeks to come. Help us, Lord, to meditate upon that which we have heard, and help us, Lord, to be desirous, hungry for the infilling, the indwelling, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We all need the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And Lord, let us never forget, let us not be neglectful in desiring of you this great promise and this great blessing of the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Help us, Lord, to meditate upon that which we have heard today. And help us, Lord, to make it part of our thinking, part of our living, that we might be in control of our spirit that we might not be neglectful, but rather, O oh God, that we might be vigilant in all things spiritual. We ask it tonight, O oh God, in none other than Jesus' precious saving name. Amen. Praise God and amen. Folks, I hope if you live in the Huntsville, Alabama area, you'll come be with us Sunday at 3 o'clock. Uh, I say Central Standard Time. That's for our online viewers. 3 o'clock in the afternoon, we meet at the Century Office Center, 3322 Memorial Parkway Southwest, Suite Number 537. That is in Huntsville, Alabama, 35801. I also hope you'll take time out next Wednesday at 7 o'clock Central Standard Time to join us once again for our continued Bible study, Ghosts, Ghouls, and Bumps in the Night. Remember, you can always find us online at www.forwardclc, all one word, forwardclc.com. Until we see you again, God bless you. In Jesus' name is our prayer.